Hi, today we're going to be talking about uh, chapter four, igneous rocks and volcanoes. So when we start looking at igneous rocks and volcanoes, uh, here's some examples of uh, some very fluid lava erupting out of Hawaii in uh, 2018. So when we start looking at lava, it can be either very fluid or very, very explosive. Uh, and part of this is due to uh, something called partial melting. And, and uh, there's a video clip, let's see if I can get that to work, that is going to show that partial melting. All right, I can't get that to work. So uh, please go to your uh, textbook ancillary material because it has this video that's talking about uh, partial melting. So we'll get into that in just a second, but make sure you do that because it's a, it's a pretty good uh, description. So when we start looking at igneous rocks, uh, the word igneous means from fire. And so when we start looking at igneous rocks, they either come from magma, which is in the ground, uh, and contains those dissolved gases, or lava, which has reached the surface. So there's three different ways that we can get rocks to melt. One is to uh, change the pressure in which it was on uh, conditions it was under. Uh, we can think of this as a really good a really good example of this as um, taking a bottle of soda, shaking it up, it's under pressure. But when we open up the lid and pop the lid on that, uh, what's going to happen is that pressure is going to be released and you're going to get an interruption. Uh, the next one is a little more um, difficult to, to visualize unless we look at something like um, solder. Now solder is made up of tin and zinc, and as a, excuse me, yeah, tin and zinc. And so, um, excuse me, lead and, and, and zinc. And uh, if you were to uh, take a soldering iron and touch it to a piece of lead, it wouldn't melt. But with the added additional flux, uh, what's going to happen is the melting point is going to be lower and uh, you have solder. And then finally, uh, you can add uh, cause rocks to melt by adding heat. So if you uh, have a rock that is right next to a piece of really hot material like, say, molten lava, uh, you can actually cause it to melt. So when we start looking at <clears throat> rocks, not all rocks melt at the same temperature. Uh, and uh, temperature and pressure are intricately related. If we increase the pressure, we also increase the temperature at which rocks will melt. Um, right. You may be familiar in, in atmospheric sciences talking about the ideal gas law. Well, we have something very similar to that in rocks that if we start looking at this table, um, we can see that if we take this, take this same rock under the same temperature and we decrease the pressure, we can see that it melts at a lower temperature. Uh, it will be the same rock, which would be totally a solid. If we just decrease the pressure, uh, what's going to happen is we can cause this rock to melt. Um, So when we start looking at rocks, where well, there's a number of different ways that we can actually cause these rocks to melt. If we cause this blob of magma to rise up, what's going to happen is it's gonna have less rock under, uh, above it and then the pressure is going to be released. And as a result, it's going to uh, uh, form a volcano. And this occurs at hotspots uh, where we have a, a, a portion of the mantle that is brought up to the surface, possibly by a convection current. And uh, by this convection, it's going to rise, uh, this material that is going to rise up is going to be under less pressure, melt, and then erupt. Um, these occur, uh, a good example of this would be Hawaii. Um, in Africa right now, we've got the African rift zone where these rocks are pulling apart and heat is rising up. And as a result, what's going to happen is that decompression is uh, going to melt. And this also occurs at the mid-ocean ridge. Um, now, to get a flux melting, what you need to do is you need to add some type of flux. 
uh, one great flux that works for rocks uh, is, um, is water. Water uh, is going to uh, lower the temperature at which rocks would melt. And as during a sub, in a subduction zone, uh, water is being transferred from the pore spaces of these rocks deeper into the earth. And so those, that water is going to uh, cause these rocks to melt. And once the rocks melt, they'll be less dense than the rocks around them. And so what's going to happen is they're going to start to rise. Um, when they experience these other rocks around here, some minerals are gonna have a lower melting point. And if it has a lower melting point, some of those samples are going to melt. Now, one sample that has the lowest melting point of uh, just about any of the common rocks is quartz. Quartz has a really low melting point, about 550 degrees Celsius uh, at atmospheric conditions. And so it's going to start to melt. And so the rocks around it are going to, uh, the, the sample is going to become more felsic or more rich in silica. The other way that we can cause rocks to melt is put it near something that's really, really hot. And uh, a really good example of this uh, would be that if we had a blob of magma and what's going to happen, it's going to cause the rocks above it to melt. And so this cooler magma is going to uh, be, do the exact same thing. So uh, as long as we have some areas that uh, are hot in the earth, we can cause the rocks above them to melt. And um, a good example of this would be occurring at hot spots. Now, when we start looking at the composition of magma, I think I mentioned the word quartz quite a bit. And I use the word quartz, and quartz is made up of purely of silicon and oxygen. And so when we start looking at a rock that is rich in silica um, or quartz, uh, we call these rocks felsic. Felsic is a, is, is a mini acronym or kind of an acronym. It tells me what ingredients are in there. The FEL is for felspar, which is a rock that is made up of silicate mineral, silicates, silicon oxygen tetrahedrons, and something else, maybe a little bit of potassium or sodium. And then some, the SIC tells us it is, that portion is pure quartz. And so when you start looking at the silica on that, it is exceedingly high which means it has a low melting point and it's a high viscosity. Viscosity is how sticky or, or, or uh, resistant to flow a sample is. Um, I always give the example of mashed potatoes and gravy. Hopefully your mashed potatoes are more viscous than your gravy. It sticks, sits together um, and doesn't, isn't as runny. Um, <clears throat> the higher the iron concentration, the more fluid the lava is. And so we can see that uh, we use the word mafic. It tells us it contains magnesium and iron, but it has a little, the IC is still tells us it does have some silica in there. It's not silica free. Again, um, half of the Earth's continental crust is made of oxygen, a quarter is silica. So th there is still some um, I, uh, silica in the mafic materials. And then if we go down into the mantle, what's going to happen is we're going to have something called ultramafic. And even that's going to have some silica, but not nearly the concentration as that mafic. Um, in between felsic and mafic, if you mix these two rock types together, uh, you can end up with something that's in between, and we call that an intermediate. Um, some of the other names that are used for these different types of uh, materials, instead of using felsic, you may hear the word granitic. And they mean the exact same thing. I like the word felsic and, uh, because it tells me what ingredients are in that, fels, felspars and silica. And um, instead of intermediate, uh, we have sometimes uh, people use the word andesitic. Andesitic uh, is andesite-like or like the Andes Mountains. It's a really good example of that. And then the final one is uh, basaltic or mafic, basalt-like. And uh, the ocean floors are going to be primarily this mafic or basaltic rock. Now, I mentioned that all minerals uh, don't have the same melting points. If we had a blob of rock, or excuse me, if we had a rock and started melting it, we'd see that different minerals are going to melt at different temperatures. Um, the, so what Mr. Bowens did is he took a rock like this 
and he put it in an oven and simulated what's going to happen in nature under the same temperature and pressure conditions. He realized that one of the minerals to precipitate out first is the mineral quartz. And if we start looking at this quartz in Muscovite, these have really, really low melting points for a rock. Um, then, he realized, then we had um, different minerals like biotite and uh, calcium rich feldspar starting to precipitate out when he melted this temperature. And he hypothesized if you went the other way, if you had a blob, if you had a blob of magma, different minerals would precipitate out first. So he took the rocks and melted them, and he hypothesized if we had a blob of magma, what would precipitate out first? And as it turns out, it's not a, um, you don't get all of the same minerals at the same time, you get different minerals precipitating out first. And so the first mineral to precipitate out of a magma tends to be these rocks that are uh, um, really, really rich in iron and magnesium. And uh, we call these ultramafic. Um, if you recall from the uh, chapter on minerals, uh, olivine is a silicate mineral, but it is, it is those isolated, sing, uh, isolated uh, independent silicon oxygen tetrahedrons. The next thing to precipitate out are still rich in iron and magnesium, but contain more, a higher concentration of silicon and oxygen. And so as a result, uh, we end up with these things called pyroxenes. Uh, <clears throat> and then double chains of silicon oxygen tetrahedrons, sheets of silicon and oxygen tetrahedrons, and then finally complex. And then lastly, all silicon and oxygen. Now, as these uh, eruptions occur, many times the gases that are going to propel these explosions are going to also yield uh, tiny particles. And we call a tiny particle in the air, whether it be a liquid or a solid, is an aerosol. Now, I know that when we think of aerosol, we think of these little spray cans. And if we start thinking about this, uh, these aeros the spray can of an aerosol is putting out little bits of liquid. And so um, they are in fact the same thing, but they're not just confined to a can. Now, uh, it's the gases that are coming out that make a, the difference between magma in the ground and lava above the ground. And so as a result, uh, we need, that's why we have two different names for magma and lava. Uh, but lava has released these gases and these gases are, are primarily three large gases, one of which is water, uh, water vapor uh, or steam. And um, then we have carbon dioxide, um, which is um, the same thing that we are breathing out. Uh, and then finally, sulfur dioxide. Uh, sulfur dioxide uh, and carbon dioxide can mix with this water in the atmosphere to create sulfuric acid or carbonic acid. So uh, the gases that are is, uh, raining down can be quite acidic associated with the volcano. So what's gonna cause magma to rise? Well, I think I already mentioned this, but the, one of the things that are gonna cause magma to rise is uh, a lack of overlying pressure. And so if we have a plate pulling apart, what's going to happen is lava is going to be allowed to rise up. Now, if the rock cools in the ground, it's going to cool much slower. It's gonna have more time for um, minerals to form. And so as a result, rocks that cool in the ground tend to have larger crystals than rocks that have escaped through the Earth's surface. And so if we take a look at a rock, we can see that these two samples here have the exact same chemical composition one cooled in the ground. And if we take a look at that, this sample and look at a side view, we can see those individual grains that tell us it cooled slowly in the ground. This sample right here has the exact same ingredients, it just cooled closer to the Earth's surface. So we didn't have time for those grains to form. And so uh, some terms you may come across when we start looking at these terms, intrusive rocks in the ground, and we can see these crystals, and so we call this a phaneritic texture, to see texture. This sample right here, you need a microscope to really see the individual minerals. They're there, they're just a lot smaller, and we'd have to look at those thin sections that we talked about uh, last chapter. 
Uh, we call these an aphanitic texture or fine-grained texture. <clears throat> and again, this is going to depend on how fast these cool crystals cool. cool. Um, and um, that's going to be in part due to the size and shape of the blob of magma, um, where it cools, if it cools near the Earth's surface, and how fast this heat can change. Um, so if we start looking at these rocks here, um, this image shows a lava flow that the top cool off faster and, than the bottom. And so as a result, as these top cool off, they shrink a little bit. And so when we start seeing these rocks sh shrinking, the top is gonna cool faster than the bottom. And so what's going to happen is gonna create these cracks uh, we call joints. Weathering can enhance these joints and what we're going to be left with are these columns. And so it's fairly common to occur to find columnar jointing, a fancy way for saying cracks that make it look like columns. And uh, this is uh, the image from the, the textbook, but if you don't wanna to have to go all the way different parts of the world to see this columnar jointing, uh, we have some right here. This is an image of Hughes Mountain, uh, in the St. Francis, St. Francis County, I believe uh, um, it is the St. Francis Mountains for sure. Uh, might be Washington County, but um, about eight miles from the college, uh, we have some of the example of these columnar jointing. Now you may say, "Wait a second, this doesn't look as nice and pretty as our, uh, the last image," but the St. Francis, uh, the this Hughes Mountain. Uh, is significantly older. So our columnar joints, while they exist, um, are a little bit more worn down. Um, this uh, next image shows some extrusive, uh, some intrusive rocks that cooled in the ground. Uh, on the left image, we have the intrusive rock that's cutting across the existing rocks. Uh, we have a special name for a rock that's cutting across other rocks and we call that a dike. Um, and so we have <clears throat> these uh, intrusive rocks that cooled in the ground, extrusive rocks exited the earth, and uh, they tend to have finer crystals. Um, now, many people travel to the uh, further west where we don't have uh, as much vegetation and much more large exposures of these igneous rocks uh, in places like the Rocky Mountains. Uh, as it turns out, here in the St. Francis Mountains, we've got some great geology. Uh, the, uh, there's a blog post by the Midwestern Geologist, and um, they have uh, well, this web, uh, web page looks at some of the beautiful features that we have here in the St. Francis Mountains. Um, here is an example, uh, a local example of the, uh, a dike cutting across some existing rocks. Uh, this is an image uh, taken from on Highway 72, right in between Fredericktown and Ironton, um, showing that igneous rock cutting across uh, in this case, other exist igneous rocks, but we see this tabular feature cutting across, so it by definition is a dike. If the sill, if it's if this lava uh, or magma is cutting through the existing rock or parallel to the existing rocks, we call that material that tabular feature a sill. And um, the way I remember this is that sill has two L's in it and it's parallel to the existing rocks. Now, not all lava uh, or magma is going to be tabular, like a book shaped. Uh, some of them are gonna be more blob-like. Um, and so we have a couple of different types of blobs of magma. Um, the first one that they're going to give is kind of a lens or a lake shaped. And uh, if we take a look at the middle image here, what happened here, this dike is producing a few sills but some of this magma that's coming up is bul bulging up the Earth's surface to creating this lens shape called a lacolith. <clears throat> Additionally, these blobs of magma, particularly with felsic-rich lava, it's 
fairly cool. As it starts to rise up, it gets thicker and thicker and thicker, and sometimes it never reaches the surface. As a result, we end up with this big blob of, of magma that cooled in the ground. And so uh, we call this big blob of material that cooled in the ground a batholith. And uh, it turns out many of the mountains uh, that we have uh, are on, in, on Earth are blobs of magma that didn't cool or didn't ever reach the surface. And so we call these a batholith. We have a large batholith here in the St. Francis Mountain. Uh, the St. Francis Mountain itself is one of this is, is um, a batholith. Now, I've already used this term. But extrusive rocks and lava flows are going to be defi de defined by its viscosity. And just again, a, a viscosity is defined as a resistance to flow. So things that have a high viscosity are really, really, really thick. Uh, things that have a low viscosity are really runny. And one of the factors that can inf influence viscosity is silica content. So something that is felsic is going to be really, really, really sticky. Something that is mafic all, th all, the, all other things being equal, is going to be a lower viscosity. And this is going to be dependent on how far it flows. Uh, some other factors that can influence viscosity is temperature and gas content. So when we start looking at this lava flow, this is very similar to the lava that was uh, in the uh, beginning slides, where this lava just was flowing like a river. Now, as a river, uh, it's of this hot molten material, the top surface is going to be exposed to the air. And so it's going to cool off. But the stuff underneath is going to have this blanket on top of it. And so what's going to happen, it's going to be able to continue to flow. And so what we have here is this skin um, of lava that has hardened, but the flow underneath is continuing to occur. This is creating what are called Pahoe hoey. This pahoe hoey is a, a literally means braids of hair. And you can kind of see how this material creates these braids of hair. So what happened in this lava is this this surface was much smoother, but this lava has continued to move down and it crumpled up and created this braided appearance. Now the rock underneath doesn't have that braided appearance. It is it is just on the veneer uh, on the surface. What's happening underneath, uh, you can see in this image, is it, because it's a glassy appearance at the top, it couldn't get those gases out. And so what happens is those gases just kind of cooled off to create little holes in an uh, igneous rock. We call a hole in an igneous rock a vesicle, uh, a vesicle and so we, call the, we would call this stuff uh, at the bottom uh, a vesicular igneous rock. Um, if the silica content was a little bit higher, or if the lava was a little bit cooler, or if we had more gases in there, what would happen is the lava would become more crumbly. And if it was much more crumbly, we'd end up with this lava called ah ah lava flows. And so this is much more crumbly. Um, the bad joke that every geologist has to give is if you, this is a sound it makes um, if you're stepping on it, uh, even after it's cooled, it's still going to be this jaggedy rub ruck rough material. So if you're walking across, it's gonna, you're going to say, ah, ah. Um, the lava flows, um, if they occur on the ocean floor, that surface is going to cool off significantly faster. And so what's going to happen is it's going to create a, what's called a pillow, a basalt pillow. And so on the ocean floor, uh, it's going to form this crust, this pillow. And so um, just like we see here, where this lava is ex exiting out, it immediately cools off and then the lava finds a path of least resistance. So it'll create a second pillow again and again and again. Now, if the rock um, has already cooled off, it still has all those gases in there. And so what can happen is those gases can be shot out to create pyroclastic debris. We already learned in our chapter on, uh, on well, on chapter three on minerals, they mentioned class. Class means pieces. We know pyro means fire. So these are fire pieces of debris. And so these are pieces of chunks of material that are thrown out from a volcano. And I mentioned uh, dust, uh, volcanic ash, and so if we take a look at this volcanic ash here, 
Uh, it is microscopic there. Uh, this is a size of uh, the, the upper left hand corner has point one millimeter. Again, a millimeter is the thickness of a coin. So this is some microscopic little bits of material. And um, these do contain silica. Even mafic lava does contain some silica. Now, um, the silica can be a, a, a very, it doesn't interact with our bodies. So if we breathe this in, um, our, we can have uh, all kinds of health problems. And so you definitely do not want to be uh, breathing in tremendous amounts of volcanic ash. Um, the larger the materials, uh, we have different sizes of materials, whether they're called uh, lapilles, uh, which are kind of walnut sized materials. And then we have things called blocks. Um, and so the image uh, of this geologist uh, for scale here is showing the, these individual pieces are blocks. Now, if they're more streamlined, we would call them uh, a bomb, but um, or a volcanic bomb. So when we start looking at rocks, uh, one of the things that we were going to look at is the igneous rock texture. Now, the texture can be crystalline, which means that it's all made up of individual interlocking crystals. Now, some of these crystals can be large or small, but if they're all crystals interlocking, uh, we're going to call it a crystalline rock. If these materials are being shot out and we have pieces of material that are kind of stacked up on one another, um, we're going to call that fragmental. Um, and, uh, and a good example of this is a material called tough. Uh, and then we have glass. Now, in the last two chapters, we've mentioned the word glass is an amorphous solid. It's um, cooled off so quickly that we don't have an internal crystalline structure. It's not truly a mineral because it doesn't have that crystalline shape or it doesn't have a crystalline structure to any of these minerals. Now, uh, the next slide in our PowerPoint talks about this magma chamber, uh, that it has some examples and some clickables. So I would encourage you to go uh, download uh, in the My Mac tab, download the resource tab, download the PowerPoint presentation, and start clicking on these if you ha uh, have, haven't already. Uh, the other place that this is available is on the web page of the um, student site uh, of the textbook, and it talks about these different features and how this magma chamber can change uh, chemical composition. Now, when we start looking at these chemical compositions, I, I already used the terms felsic, intermediate, mafic, and then ultramafic. Um, we're not gonna worry too much about ultramafic uh, because these occur at depth uh, and usually in the mantle. Uh, the only thing I will say about these ultramafics in, in the mantle is when they do occur, uh, some of this olivine, some of the temperature and pressure conditions can create um, diamonds. And so uh, we did talk about the kimberlite tubes. So that would be about the only place that you would expo be exposed to one of these ultramafic rocks, unless we start drilling down to the mantle, which we've never done in human history. But I do want to focus a lot on felsic, intermediate, and mafic. And so uh, if you're in the lab class, you're going to be identifying these felsic, intermediate, and mafic rocks. And uh, one of the tricks and tools that geologists will tend to use when we start looking at these felsic, intermediate, and mafic is color. Now, as it turns out, felsic silica tends to be more whites and pinks. And uh, this image looks a little more gray, uh, greened out. But when we start looking at <clears throat> inter, uh, intermediate materials, they tend to have, or mafic materials, I should say, let's focus on that. Mafic materials tend to have more blacks and greens. And an intermediate would be something in between. Now, <clears throat> as we've already realized, um, we have a continuous spectrum in nature many times. And so this continuous spectrum is going to talk about, uh, we may end up with some samples that are really, really, really felsic, really, really almost all light colored minerals. An example would be something like this, or some local samples like this. But then we're going to have a little bit more iron in them, giving a little bit more and so we can, might end up with something like this. It's right near the edge 
of this light colored material. If we went a little bit more, we're going to have more iron rich materials. And so we would create, call this one a diorite. It contains light colored minerals and dark colored minerals. But um, it's going to, again, be right. I gave you an example of a kind of a medium grade diorite. Uh, and then if we went even darker, we then, uh, or I, more iron rich, we'd end up with this mafic rich rock. So all three of these samples here have large grains. I just picked these three samples of granite, diorite, and gabbro because we can see those grains and that makes a nice contrast in size. If those rocks all cooled quickly, we'd have the exact same chemical compositions. They'd just be smaller grains and then we'd use the terms rhyolite, andesite, and basalt. And again, this image here shows that it is a continuous spectrum. And so we might end up with samples that are right here or some samples out, uh, in your lab. Um, one of the things that you may want to do is take your samples. They're all numbered. They should be numbered. If, uh, make sure they're numbered before you play around with these. But start lining them up. See which one is the more felsic rich material, which means it's going to be lighter. If it's more mafic, it's going to be dealing with uh, more of those iron rich minerals. Now, one thing I would recommend is to uh, make sure you, when dealing with the igneous rocks, look at the samples to identify which ones are igneous rocks. Do not try to, I, I've had students that, are, that aren't paying attention to this and will start to use the sedimentary rocks and try to classify these sedimentary rocks and that doesn't work well. So you make sure you're looking only at the igneous rocks for your igneous rock identification lab. Now, I mentioned those vesicles. The, there is some cases that those vesicles, those vesicles are going to rise up and get bigger and bigger and bigger. In some cases, we end up with glass around those vesicles so much that we end up with these samples that look quite heavy, but in fact, are exceedingly light. This sample right here is, oh, just a, a few ounces. Um, I really wish I could show I, I could show you on a screen how light this sample is. Uh, this image shows that it's uh, underneath a twenty dollar bill apparently, um, but this is a very 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 light sample. Uh, we call this sample pumice. Uh, you may be familiar with pumice, uh, where you could actually use this as an abrasive because it has a silica in there. It's a good abrasive and it has all these little pockets to hold um, dead skin that you could scrape along and uh, file away your dead skin cells. Um, uh, if you're doing the lab, don't use my samples for that. Um, if there's no bubbles, then we're going to end up with this truth volcanic glass and you can see that glassy texture. Now if you looked under a microscope, you would actually still see those same gr glassy texture, um, but it's microscopic. And then um, if we had samples that had lots and lots of bubbles in them, still um, not quite to the point of, uh, of pumice, uh, we're going to end up with a sample called scoria. <clears throat> um, we have uh, samples around here that uh, have little bits of volcanic rock that are glued back together. We call this volcanic breccia. And so in this case, we've got a p golf ball's piece of pumice in our samples. Now, around here in the St. Francis Mountains, we do have some very unique samples that we have some igneous rocks In the St. Francis Mountains, we have some rocks that do in fact have these little bits of pumice. Uh, our pumice is, is much smaller pieces and they've been smashed a little bit. Here's another example of that, um, where we have these small samples which have um, been 
small bits of pumice that have been squished. Um, now, sometimes this pumice can be, sometimes this pumice uh, can be erupted in the ocean. Uh, the USGS, Uh, took some satellite images of, um, so you have some clouds in the top left image of a pumice raft. And you can type into an internet search uh, USGS pumice raft and see this um, raft of pumice. Pumice again is less dense than water. And so the lower image is an image uh, from the USGS that uh, shows that pumice uh, floating on water and they're driving a boat through a pumice island, a floating island there. Um, so again, these volcanic eruptions can be very, very, very fluid. And uh, we would expect this to be occurring in some mafic rich lava. Um, lava is going to be very, very fluid, low viscosity. It's going to be very runny. Then we have some volcanic activities that's much more explosive, where we're blasting this material out. And uh, this is a response to two different things. One is high amounts of gas, or two, uh, this can be a re result of really, really sticky lava. And so uh, a great example of this would be in Mount Etna uh, in Italy, uh, where we have this pyroclastic material being shot out. Uh, Mount St. Helens would be another example of some very explosive eruptions. Now these eruptions are, are when we start looking at a volcano, uh, of every volcano is going to have a magma chamber, a blob of magma, a source of that molten material th that is going to eventually create this volcano. And so what's going to happen, uh, the magma is going to leave this chamber and start rising near the Earth's surface. If it uh, erupts near the surface, we call this uh, a vent. Uh, many times when this vent will occur, it'll blast this material out and leave behind a crater. Uh, it, the lava doesn't care which way it goes. It's gonna find the path of least resistance. So if it's easier to get out the side, um, it's going to vent out the side and we call that a flank vent. Um, so this is going to create, uh, we have three major categories of volcanoes. Uh, shield volcanoes, which uh, from a um, aerial view, it looks very similar to a shield. Uh, a cinder cone, now a cinder is the size of pyroclastic material. So this would be just a pile of material. It kind of looks like a giant anthill um, of, of pyroclastic material. And then we have a stratovolcano, a stratovolcano means strata means layer and so we have a layer of lava and pyroclastic material uh, another name for a stratovolcano is a composite volcano because it's a composite of these other two so let's look at that shield volcano that shield volcano is a lava flow upon lava flow really really large fluid lava um, these are the lava flows that you'd like to go see because you can actually walk up and 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 have very low risk not no risk uh, but lower risk where this lava just is running down. The image of the um, lava flows in Hawaii are great examples of these large shield volcanoes. And so the island of Hawaii, the big island of Hawaii, which is the active volcano, is about 50 miles across at the ocean, uh, at, uh, at sea level. We know that the lava is, or the island is much larger than that as it had to go through the entire water column, but it's this big, broad, flat um, volcano. The other type of volcano uh, is called a cinder cone, another type. And uh, what happens on these cinder cones is when lava is reaching to the Earth's surface, it's going to find paths of the least resistance, uh, and we're going to end up with much stickier lava. And so pyroclasts just get shot out. Uh, there's some really good examples of this. Uh, in some cases, this shield volcano, near the end of its eruption, some of these flank eruptions can start to cool off and actually create cinder cones on these shield volcanoes. These cinder cones are significantly smaller, much more short-lived than the larger shield volcanoes. Um, there's a couple of different 
famous cinder cones. Sunset Crater in Arizona is, is an example of one of these. Um, if you go a little bit further south, uh, Paracutin in the 1940s, we actually saw the birth of this volcano and it was actually caught on film where this pyroclastic material just got shooting out of this guy's cornfield and got bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, and it, later it engulfed the entire uh, field and um, about a mile across. The final type of volcano that we're gonna be dealing with are these things called strata volcanoes. Strata means layer. So you have a layer of pyroclastic material with a lot of empty air spaces in between. And we know that those air, air is easily compressed. And so this creates a very, very dangerous environment because then you can have a layer of lava on top of it. And that la lava can be uh, holding in that pressure. And so what's going to happen, a pyroclastic material, then lava, pyroclastic, we're gonna create a layered appearance, a strata volcano. And these can be very, very explosive because what can happen again, that lava can hold that gases in. And when it goes, look out. Uh, so when you start, start looking at some of the most deadly volcanoes, they tend to be these strata volcanoes, sometimes called intermediate volcanoes because they're, again, not the small little cinder cones. They're not the huge fluid runny lava. There's something in between. And so they're bigger uh, than the cinder cones, but they also have some of the pyroclastic material being shot out. Now, after the lava has erupted, what can be left behind is a cavity underneath this magma chamber. If you have this cavity underneath, the weight of the overlying rocks are going to cause a subsidence to create this cauldron called a caldera. Um, one of the most famous calderas is um, Crater Lake in Oregon, uh, where we have an entire lake developed uh, on top of a volcano. And that caldera is now filled with water. Now, so there's a number of dangers associated with um, volcanoes. Obviously, if you're in the path of these fluid lava flows, uh, that can destroy and burn anything in its path, including structures. Uh, but that, that one is usually moving from slow enough that you could actually um, outrun that type of volcanic activity from these very fluid lava flows. Unfortunately, it's you, you can't move a house. And so um, uh, the main island, big island of Hawaii has had some villages that have been just totally engulfed with this fluid lava. The next volcanic activity that uh, can cause problems are these pyroclastic materials. These rocks that are being thrown out can actually hurt you. And so this is a bit of a problem. Um, the ash associated with this can cause breathing problems. Now, when intermediate volcanoes uh, erupt, it's very, very common to get these pyroclastic flows, these hot air, fire debris material being shot down um, in the upwards of 100, uh, 100 kilometers an hour, 60 miles an hour. Uh, that's what happened in, uh, in um, Mount St. Helens uh, when, when its eruption took place. And so anything in this path, and this is some really hot, fiery air. Um, uh, another example of this um, was Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD, where this hot air basically came down the mountain and um, killed anything in its path. Um, this volcanic ash can uh, mix with, uh, if we had a glacier on top of a volcano, uh, it would melt that glacier and then you'd end up with a mix of mud. Uh, these mud flows are called lahars and uh, they can rapidly bury structures uh, in, in, in destroy homes and lives. Uh, on occasion, we can have a volcano that can go into the water to create a tsunami. Um, we can also have, uh, as these rocks are breaking up through, through the Earth's surface, they can create earthquakes. Um, some of the other problems associated with these gases um, is carbon dioxide is more dense than oxygen. And so um, Mount Toba in Africa is a 
unfortunate example of what happened when some of these gases released, it was a very diffuse eruption. And so these gases um, displaced the oxygen. And so unfortunately, it killed everybody, uh, just about everyone in that town uh, in, in near um, Mount Toba. If you'd like to look at that, there's a number of good documentaries that talk about the uh, eruptions uh, or, or, or the, the gases that have wiped out, volcanic gases that have wiped out an entire villages. Um, there's uh, been some concern in California in Mammoth Lake, uh, the same sort of thing could occur. One of the ways to alleviate this is to uh, stop these gases from building up. And many times they get build up underneath lake deposits. And so uh, the, the water can become very uh, carbonic, uh, rich in carbon dioxide. And so if you mi mix the water around, you can get rid of these gases uh, so they don't build up. Uh, um, in Iceland, we had an eruption just a few years ago that grounded all air traffic. Uh, this ash is going to have uh, some high amount of silica, so it could be uh, quite a strong abrasive. And so if you tried flying a plane through uh, volcanic ash, you could grind up your turbines. Um, and I've already mentioned gases and ash uh, contain carbon dioxide and sulfur. Uh, which can create sulfuric acid and carbonic acid, which can cause acid rain. Now, uh, when these volcanic eruptions occur, they put out a tremendous amount of aerosols. Again, those particulates in the air, uh, whether it be solid or a liquid, that can block out sunlight. And so as a result, um, we can see in this chart from your book showing that uh, the years prior to uh, um, the eruption in the Philippines, Mount Pinatubo, um, we had much warmer temperatures. And then the following year, we had significant, following few years, we had cooler environments as a result of these particulates that stayed in the air uh, for a number of years. The probably most famous example um, was uh, in 19, 1815, um, there was a var large eruption that occurred in. Indonesia, and this put out so much particulates that um, it was dubbed the year without summer, 1816 is the year without summer. Um, I uh, there have been accounts of being able to go ice skating in Boston at this time. Uh, all of the air uh, was, um, it was significantly cooler and so more people huddled in. Um, there's been a lot of, um, discussion about this, but I, uh, a couple of books that have indicated that um, people were gathering in and telling more ghost stories. And as a result of this hanging out around a campfire for a little prolonged period, uh, this led to uh, the, or the, the, the book um, Frankenstein by, uh, by Miss Shelley um, producing this large uh, uh, hanging out around a campfire. Uh, some of the other impacts locally, uh, the Northeast part of the United States did not have any, uh, destroyed all of their uh, apple trees. And so uh, uh, some of the trees from Mexico, Missouri, uh, apple trees were sent back uh, to the East Coast to uh, repopulate those apples. <clears throat> Volcanoes, uh, it's always good to know if we're going to be experiencing one of these eruptions. And so, first of all, the first step in protecting ourselves is trying to determine if our volcano is active, dormant, or extinct. Um, fortunately for us, in the St. Francis Mountains, uh, in the mineral area, our volcanic activity is extinct. We do have lots of igneous rocks around here, but our volcano is extinct. The magma chamber has cooled off, there's nothing left, to cause an eruption. Um, that's not the case for um, places like the Pacific Northwest. We have some very active volcanoes. Now you may say you're, to yourself, wait a second, it's active? Mount St. Helens was, well, 40 years ago. Um, and so, yes, in geological terms, it is quite active. Um, then we have uh, dormant volcanoes, kind of an in-between. It's active, but nothing is happening uh, currently. So it's, it would be considered um, dormant. 
Now, um, one thing that we'll look at on this is that a lot of these active volcanoes um, are, have this conical structure because it's, again, weathering hasn't occurred. But over time, what will happen is these um, volcanic areas are going to um, cool off and uh, weather away and get smaller and smaller. So one of the ways that we can identify if we're experiencing any uh, increased risk is to look at how often these occur, how often these volcanoes occur. Now, there's one volcano that's made quite a, a bit of news in um, the last, well, well, since we had aerial photography and realized what exactly this was, and that's Yellowstone. Yellowstone has had a series of volcanoes, uh, at least three large eruptions that have occurred um, in the last two and a half, uh, 2.2 million years. And they occur about every 600 to 800,000 years. So 600 to 600,000 years ago, um, 1.2 million years ago, and about 1.8 to 2 million years ago, uh, we had three significant large eruptions. And so as three large eruptions every 600,000 years, we're due for another one. Now, geologically due, not necessarily tomorrow. Um, when we start looking at geologic time, there's quite a bit larger time uh, error mess, uh, uh, ranges. And so when we start looking at long-term uh, uh, long intervals, we can start to see these occur every so often as pressure is building up, as plates are moving, causing these different types of eruptions. Then we have some short term. Is there anything immediate, much more pressing that would tell us? And so one of the things that we can do is we can start to see uh, using high, uh, high precision GPS, what's happening is the ground rising. And so uh, the image over here on Mount, um, Mount Longorot, um, it, from 2004 to 2006, we can see that we've had, this area has risen up nine centimeters. Now again, a centimeter, it's about that thick, so nine of these, so about four inches. Well, that means that my magma is rising up in this region. Uh, additionally, uh, we might start to see earthquakes as, the round, as magma is rising up, it might break the rocks around them to create individual earthquakes, or in some cases, earthquake swarms, uh, where we have lots and lots of little tiny earthquakes. Uh, maybe we can start seeing a change in heat flow. Uh, we know that Yellowstone has some eruption, uh, has uh, some geysers, and so if, uh, a, and hot geothermal activity. If we start seeing um, changes in water temperature um, in some of the uh, water uh, geothermal features, that might indicate that we had some changes in that heat flow. Uh, changes in gas and steam emissions. Now what happens for Yellowstone to create Old Faithful is water is seeps into the ground, comes in contact with the hot rock underneath that's under tremendous amounts of pressure. And so what's going to happen is eventually that water is going to get too hot and turn to steam. That steam takes up more space. It'll, it'll push that water out. And as that bubble starts to rise, just like a, a bubble in your, uh, your soda, it's going to get larger and larger. And then what's going to happen is the top little bit of water gets shot out, and that's what we see as a geyser. Um, we can also see um, if the ground starts to tilt. And so we can put basically a level on the ground, and if the ground starts to tilt, uh, we could see that the level would not be level. And so then we could start to um, delineate looking at if we have this eruption and maybe more one side of the mountain is rising up faster than the other. Well, that looks like that would be the side to, to uh, maybe start to call for some evacuations. Uh, and so we can start looking at all of our risks and create a hazards risk map. Uh, and so we can start to figure out what area would, if we had lava flowing, it's going to follow, uh, if it's really fluid lava, it's going to follow the uh, path of least resistance. And so we can see um, uh, where hot water and, and ash particulates can create these lahars or mud flows. And so this is a map showing where those blood, mud flows would be occur, occurring. Um, and then the pyroclastic materials could be all around that mountain. And so they might actually do some evacuation evacuations. Uh, we are quite fortunate in Mount St. Helens that uh, we did call for an evacuations 
but um, not everyone heeded the call. Um, and uh, we we're very fortunate that that occur, uh, uh, ev ev eruption occurred um, on a Sunday. If it happened during a workday, uh, many more loggers uh, might have uh, lost their life as a response to that eruption. Now, in some rare cases, we actually have been able to change the course of this lava. Um, there was a bad movie from the 1990s called, um, I believe it was called Earthquake, or Volcano, uh, with Tommy Lee Jones, and they used some cinder um, or some concrete pylons to kind of divert the flow of this lava. Well, it would melt, uh, the, the lava, uh, <coughs> Concrete would have a much lower melting point than the temp than this lava, and it would just melt. Uh, there's been a couple of cases that we have been able to divert the flow of lava, but these are very, very limited examples. So where do we have volcanoes occurring? Well, the first place that we have a lot of volcanoes occurring is at the mid-ocean ridge, and we can see that um, at those divergent plate boundaries where we have mid-ocean ridges, those are where we have a lot of volcanoes. Um, pressure is releasing, lava can escape. Then we have convergent plate boundaries where plates are pushing together. And if plates are pushing together, uh, we have some extra water in this area and that can create some volcanoes. Um, if the mid-ocean ridge extends into the continent, um, this is going to create rocks pulling apart, again, decompression. And then finally, we'll have hot spots. And a good example of this would be Hawaii. Where we had, or the Galapagos, where we end up with this hot, hot material burning its way through the plate moving, creating another volcano. Now, when in, in the ocean floor, uh, this creates some under very unique features associated with this decompression melting. Um, one is uh, the water is tremendous amount of pressure, and so as a result, you can have really, really, really hot temperature water, hundreds of degrees Celsius water. It's not causing it to boil because of the water pressure. Um, and so what's going to happen is this super hot water comes in contact with colder water around. So we have a, a, a uh, minerals precipitating out very, very quickly. And so this creates something called a black smoker. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, black smokers again in the ocean, oceanography chapter. But um, these are uh, going to talk about them a little bit here in chapter on volcanoes. At convergent boundaries, I already mentioned, um, so where we have this plate being shoved underneath, uh, in this case, Alaska. And so um, this trench is going to cause some decompression melting, some melting of, uh, adding of water, in this flux creating a series of volcanoes. Uh, this looks like South America, so this would be the Andes Mountains. Where two plates are pulling apart, uh, we have rifting, and so we have Mount Kilimanjaro here uh, as an example of this um, decompression uh, where the plate are pulling apart. Um, in, the, in Hawaii, we have the hot spot melting, as I already mentioned, where this lava is burning its way through. And so this island would be the big island of Hawaii and the plate would be it would be moving and so um i commonly uh, on occasion i'll get questions about as this lava rises up why don't we end up with just a continuous row well if we already got a tunnel the lava is going to fo follow that same tunnel until it can't and so as a result this this plate is going to move across the screen and then it's going to rise up and then find its next exit point and the big island of Hawaii still has some lava underneath it, but we've actually have gotten the start of a new island. Um, and about two years ago, um, we had a the, the birthplace of a new Hawaiian island. So here is a, uh, um, a little animation that shows how this lava will um, uh, this hotspot will create a series of islands. So there are some other places on Earth that have some huge lava flows. I've already mentioned Yellowstone, where we end up with 
all uh, the hot spot occurring, creating these different volcanic activity or different eruptions. Again, we can use the reoccurrence interval to figure out when the next one is going to be occurring. 0 0.6, 1.2, um, 2 million years ago. Uh, some of these are significantly uh, larger lava flows. Uh, we also have this Columbia River basalts. These are huge lava flows. If it's basalt, we mean it's really fluid, so we had a really large eruption occur occurring in this location. Uh, so uh, this concludes the chapter on, on uh, volcanoes and igneous rocks. And so um, make sure that you go through these questions before you take your lecture quiz.